Fellow citizens, I am not warning in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men too. Great enough to give frame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to raise at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable. And yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes. And for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Who so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? Who so stolid and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs? I am not that man. In a case like that, the dumb might eloquently speak and the lame man leap as an heart but such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that has brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn, to drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems where inhuman mockery and sacri sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct, and let me warn you, that it is dangerous to copy the examples of a nation whose crimes towering up to heaven were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, burying that nation in irrevocable ruin. I can today take up the plaintive lament of a peeled and woe-smitten people. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they carried us away captive, required of us a song, and they who wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous, yesterday are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth to forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason, most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing there, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, 
false to the present and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave, on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce with all the emphasis I can command everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command, and yet no one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. But I fancy I hear some of my audience say it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do the people of this country need light? Must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? That point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which, if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes while will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that Southern statute books are covered with enactments forbidding, under severe fines and penalties, the teaching of the slave to read or to write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beast of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then I will argue with you that the slave is a man. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the well in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice? Hard to be understood. How should I look today in the presence of Americans dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have a natural right to freedom, speaking of it relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively, to do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, 
to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No. I will not. I have better employment for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine? That God did not establish it? That our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in my thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? They that can, may, I cannot, that the time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed and its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than any other days in a year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Allow me to say in conclusion, Notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened, and the doom of slavery is certain. I, therefore, leave off where I began with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did in ages ago. No nation can shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot around in the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time when such could be done, long established customs of hurtful character could formally fence themselves in and do their evil work with social impunity. Knowledge was then confined and enjoyed by the privileged few and the multitude walked on in mental darkness. But a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arm of commerce has borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. It makes its pathway over and under the sea as well as on the earth. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide but link nations together from Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are distinctly heard on the other. The far-off 
and almost fabulous Pacific rolls in grandeur at our feet. The celestial empire, the mystery of ages is being solved. The fiat of the almighty, let there be light, has not yet spent its force. No abuse, no outrage, whether in taste, sport, or avarice can now hide itself from the all-pervading light. The iron shoe and crippled foot of China must be seen in contrast with nature. Africa must rise and put on her yet unwoven garment. Ethiopia shall stretch out her hand unto God in the fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison. I say, and let every heart join in saying it, God speed the year of the Jubilee the worldwide. When their galling chains set free, the oppressed shall widely bend the knee and wear the yoke of tyranny like brutes no more. That year will come and freedom's reign to man his ponderous rights again restore. God speed the day when human blood shall cease to flow and every clime be understood the claims of human brotherhood and each return for evil good, not blow for blow. That day will come all feuds to end and change into a faithful friend each foe. God speed the hour the glorious hour when none on earth shall exercise a lordly power nor in a tyrant's presence cower but to all manhood stature tower by equal birth that hour will come to each to all and from his prison house to thrall go forth until that year day hour arrive with head and heart and hand i'll strive to break the rod and rend the gave the spoiler of his prey deprive so witness heaven, and never from my chosen post, whatever the peril of the cost be driven.